in, in the book itself and in the kind of new chapter, there's a new chapter uh, that deals with the Anglo Bank and the, and the promissory notes and that whole kind of trying to explain that in, in readable prose. It's not easy. Um, but, but, but going back to the bank guarantee itself, because I think that in the last four or five years, they've been able to rewrite that narrative. Um, and it's quite incredible how it's been done. That it changed the kind of the uh, the, the timeline of the of, of the whole thing, you know. Cash customer, cash customer, cash customer. Quick audience, sorry, actually. Uh, Fiona, did you think it was on a date? No, that's him. Yeah, that's her. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. That, that's probably that's, That was it. Yeah. First off, you know. But going back to the kind of bank guarantee itself, and I, I think how it, it, it was sold was, it was this idea that's going to put forward that what can the banks do? And <coughs> certainly part of the narrative um, in the newspapers anyway, even, even today still is that banks recycle savings. This is one of the ideas ideas that's put forward. That there's excess savings over here and there's people who need loans and banks are just in the middle and they help to kind of move around um, excess savings into into those who need loans. And I think part of the bank guarantee was that they, they kind of changed it to that. That's what was guaranteed. They were guaranteeing real money and real savings and that was the whole point of it. And sure it all blew up and sure it, it was all their fault and we all went mad. That's the narrative. But really what they were already kind of guaranteed, and I know the country did this, was what, how banks really fund themselves. And how banks really fund themselves is not this way, but it's this way here. <laughs> and this is the whole alphabet soup of mortgage-backed securities and residential-backed securities and, and money market funds and all the other kind of different pieces of paper that banks use to fund themselves. And that's what Ireland guaranteed. And no one else did it because it's crazy. Um, mm. And nobody else did it. Um, how they've changed this narrative, and I think Mark might have come across this anyway, it just in kind of research, was this was actually called on the day. Um, about two days after it, there, there was an article by Simon Carswell. He gets a couple of things wrong in it anyway, but he's explaining why the guarantee was given. And this is in the first 48 hours, the halcyon days when Ireland was seen to have uh, outsmarted all of Europe. Have we, have we forgotten those few weeks when we all thought we were the smartest kids on the block and everyone, it, would be, it only lasted for, for about six weeks. Mm. Um, yeah, you know, and, and that kind of buzz might have been only current, I'd say, among people wearing suits and working in the yeah. banking industry, I think. Oh, no, I think it was, it was on the streets as well, you know? There was, yeah. a, there was a feeling of it there, a street there. Mm. Yeah. But I just thought that... Mm. And it's like, this one, something mm. It says here in, in, in the part that's that's on the line. This isn't homework, yeah, by the way. That there's no exam after this, so so don't so <laughs> worry about it. There'll be no questions at the end. Yeah. Um, he says that um, everyday savers it will have responded favorably to the government a guaranteeing a customer deep deposits at, at the six Irish owned banks and build society. So however, you see here, Ireland had already done that the previous month yeah. when they guaranteed a, a deposit up to 100,000 euros, covering 97% of all customer deposits were already yeah. covered. Um, at 20,000, it was 90% mm. of all customer deposits, mm. but they went higher. And Europe went crazy because then they had to somehow kind of match it. Mm -hmm. And they went for, for 50,000 and then for 100,000. And that played out with Cyprus there recently kind of last year, mm -hmm. where that 100,000 you know, guarantee was called upon. And then they tried to break it and then they didn't, and, you know, all, all the mm -hmm. other things. But this part here, the terms covered bonds, senior debt, and dated subordinated debt, lower tier two capital, may be a gobbledygook to most, bank, uh, to most bank customers, but the senior bankers, they are their lifeblood. And what Carlos was talking about, of course, is this here. There's all this here. And, that, and that's what was guaranteed. Mm. Um, and why that happened, we can go into. 
maybe in kind of Q&A, but it is important to say that this was covered and it was named in the newspapers. It was covered in the newspapers. Um, this part here, that's underlined. The unprecedented government guarantee is aimed at encouraging depositors and investors to keep their money in Irish-owned institutions and to attract new depositors and investors, helping the banks to raise hard-to-get short-term funding. That's what the bank guarantee was really all about. On the 15th of September, Lehman Brothers kind of collapsed, um, and the uh, um, and the US said that they wouldn't bail it out, and that was the final kind of uh, push to freeze up the the interbank lending market. How banks raise money is by borrowing. The largest consumers of credit in the world are banks. Banks are in, are, are in a constant state of bankruptcy. Um, how would they get over this is by borrowing from each other on the short-term money markets. The, the problem for Anglo banking, this really is about Anglo, um, was that that was frozen out of those short-term money markets. Anglo had calls made due on the 30th of September and it couldn't meet those calls. It needed something to, to bring into the a money markets as, as a collateral. They tried putting up their, their loan book, of course everyone just laughed because they, they knew how rotten it was. So they put up us instead. They put up the entire Irish state. Um, and it went pear -shaped. It went up, obviously kind of pear shaped and it, and it blew up in their, in their faces. But it, it, it was to give them access to this market and Ireland went as a guarantor. In this market there are no state guarantees or weren't any state guarantees until Ireland kind of walked into it. And that plays out in like 2010 because Ireland, when Ireland gave a guarantee that went into the interbank in the market, the, 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 the kind of um, strength of, of the Irish state now merged with the guarantees that were given in this system. And again, going back to Carswell, because they thought they had outsmarted everyone, they were very, the banks were very open about what they had done. The, they shut down the markets where banks raise the, the money. Um, the government believes its guarantee will unfreeze these markets for Irish banks, shorten up the Irish financial and system and the economy. And Dennis Casey, Chief Executive of, of, of Irish Life and Parent, said the guarantee it, it would allow permanent NTSB and other Irish banks cover to borrow more cheaply. Quote, the oxygen, the, the oxygen supply for Irish banks was being cut off and healthy banks were starting to gasp for breath. This guarantee turns on the oxygen supply. No talk of mortgage debt, no talk of, of a mortgage crash. That's happening about 20, mid 20. In 2009, by 2010, that really starts kind of kicking in. This is about access to the short-term money market funds. And these guys thought that they, they, they'd worked out a very clever way of doing it. However, they you turn over the sheet. Uh -huh. <laughs> the next day, on the 3rd of October, the ECB gave its opinion on the Irish a, a, a guarantee. It says here on part 2.4, as a further general comment, the ECB notes that the Irish authorities have opted for an individual response to the current financial situation. The narrative now is that the ECB forces on us. I'll go into why that narrative has been put forward kind of later on. And not sought to consult their EU partners. Black and white, Ireland did a solo run. In view of the similarities of the causes and consequences of the current financial distress across EU member states and the potential interdependencies of policy re uh, responses, it would have been advisable to properly consult other EU authorities on the envisioned uh, legislative plans, which they didn't do. But the last part here. A further point uh, uh, it relates to the risks to the government's budgetary position arising from any financial support to Irish credit institutions. While the ECB appreciates that any guarantees that are provided by the Minister under the draft law would be contingent in nature, and as we know they won't. Given that the financial exposure of the Irish state under such guarantees is potentially very large, the, the, the Irish government could be 
obliged to make significant payments in case these guarantees are called over the next two years. As a point in time, the Irish Ibutchery position is deteriorating and may risk exceeding the 3% of GDP a reference value for published uh, public deficits. This is a cause for concern even when the, the revision of substantial support would, under the draft law, as far as possible, ultimately have to be recouped from the credit <coughs> institution or subsidiary in question. I mean, if you get rid of the, the, the kind of bureaucratic uh, language, they're saying, you cannot guarantee this. What are you doing? Why have you done this? They did not understand it. We understand it, I think, from a class perspective. That's why it makes sense. I think class just sharpens the, the whole kind of vision for it. Uh, as I said, this, this isn't homework, okay. so it's, you know, so you're Thanks. grand, but it's just to make it easier than tracking the this out here. But I think it is interesting that whereas in 2010, there's no doubt, the ECB came in and said, we're taking over. That's absolutely true. But in 2008, that wasn't true. And what they've done since is to conflate those two events and try and make out that in 2008, it was imposed from the, you know, you know, by the Germans, and in 2010, it, you know, it was imposed by them all over again. I'd say this was the indigenous Irish bourgeoisie bailing themselves out and it blew up in their faces, in our faces. Yeah. And, and they've been covering that narrative ever since. And they've more or less gotten away with it. Yeah. Because even in kind of left circles, I, I have a problem trying to explain this. Um, yeah. It's really difficult. People just give me the, it was the Germans and what did it. I said, but listen, 2010, that, that's a different gig. But 2008, this was the Irish. Mm. The Irish and the bourgeoisie, and how they make money, mm. and that's the last part of the of the talk is to try and explain that because hopefully I do a good job in the mm. eighty thousand words here. So I'm not going to go all the eighty thousand words, but just kind of make that key point. What I'm trying to do here is sketch the contours of that class, how they operate, how they make money, and how they, um, you know, how they have carved out. Um, they have carved this country in, in their own image, and what a sight it is to behold. For sure. Um, so, getting back to what we're trying to protect, what, is, what are some of the things? Well, part of it is the meat, is the, is the, is the area that the East, it, it, the Irish bourgeoisie have carried out for themselves in the global financial system itself, anyway. Uh, this is Ireland's empire. Um, 2.5 trillion in, in assets. Hi. Okay. Um, 167 uh, countries. There's around 2.5 trillion in assets under administration in the IFSC, shorthand for the Irish Financial Services Centre. Um, it's not just in the, the Docklands anymore. There's one branch of it on, on South Mall. Uh, but it's mainly is still based up in Dublin. Um, now it's under administration in Ireland. It's not under, it's not under management. <laughs> Oh, you need to get some. Are oh, you dragging someone away? Please don't. <laughs> <laughs> Forty percent drop off. Um, yeah. It's under administration in Ireland, not under management. Those funds are, are under management somewhere else. It's under administration here for tax purposes. Mm. Part of how this kind of bourgeoisie makes its money now is by facilitating a tax avoidance on a global scale, and they've carved out a niche for themselves in kind of certain aspects. Then of that. Uh, this is from the Irish Funds Association's brochure into, into Ireland. Because nobody looks at this. Um, as you know yourself, I mean, no one really looks at this. They, it is incredible how open they, they are on their websites about actually what they do. Um, if you go into the, into the website of the main kind of law firms who deal with this, they will give you, in very clear prose, how to avoid tax use in Ireland's tax laws. Uh, because it's all legal. It's tax avoidance, it's not tax evasion. It's all legal. Um, so what does this mean by having this empire here, this, this 2.5 trillion? If that was a GDP, it's, it's larger than the GDP of the UK. And it's ministered by about 24,000 people. So um, if you look here again, just another kind of aspect to it. This was recently on 22nd of, of Feb, 2013. NAM announced that it plans to develop significant additional office space within the Dublin Central Business uh, District with emphasis on the Docklands area. Now I'm going to use the phrase the IFSC for that. It really isn't, it's, it's not technically that 
the, the IBC is, is just three or four streets in the Docklands, but it's used as a shorthand for that whole area, for the financial aspect to it. Mm. But they're going to give two billion, and what it is is that they're going to give out loans to people to build new office blocks because no one else really wanted to take them to build. It's two billion, and it's like much needed new office space. Well, that's all. Well, I'll, that's only down the road at all. So I'll have a look, and I'll see what's in there. So. Recently, I went for a walk around the IFSC, and uh, this is the AIB I International Centre. As you walk out of like Busaris from Gold Bus, you'll see mm. this kind of facing you. It's a big kind of two-let sign on it. Yeah. Um, there's some more there. That it does a side image there, just for the 3D version. Yeah. Um, here's more offices here, like that are two-let. Here's the IIB Trade Centre. That's for two-let. Uh, this is next to the Lewis uh, station, that's to let. Um, that's on the side of it there. Uh, that's another one just down from the IB Country Centre. It's, it's uh, La Touche House, and there's offices there as well. Um, these are down by Five Harbour Master Place, and I'll talk about that one later on. Mm. Then Declan Security showed up, <laughs> and they tried blocking me, and he said, hey, you can't take photographs here, and I said, I'm breaking the law, I said, yes, as well, I'm breaking the law, call the guards, and then he didn't, and says that, that they didn't want to call the guards, but then they went on again, and then he, you know, he, um, he, he got his mate, but if they get into something, it's a bit blurred, but I did try. Yeah. You know, under kind of circumstances, to 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 try and get kind of photographs over there. You and know? It shows action anyway. Yeah, and then there you see, look, look at, look at, I got, I just got down there as well. So thank God. But he was he was on the ball here. He was, you know what I mean? He was he was, he was, he was very sharp here, right? And then he told me where his jurisdiction ended, which was on kind of Common Street, which is where the actual legal IFSC area kind of stops. So he said, this is now outside of my jurisdiction. So I said, okay, grand. Carried on. So here's more empty spaces. Here are more uh, down by the Anglo uh, Shell, and then here as well. Here's one. And then I just gave up. Just saw I, I can't be asked walking anymore. Um, but they're going to give uh, two billion to build more office spaces in in that area. There's around 21 percent vacancy in in office space in Dublin at the moment. That is one in five, mm. or sorry, one fifth because it's on kind of square meters. So one fifth of of the square meters. Of, of office space in, in Dublin is like is is is, is currently vacant. The reason why they they want to build new buildings is not for the buildings but for the tax breaks that come with them. Mm. And that's the difference. If there's a way of kind of seeing it is that um, when we think of property we probably we probably think of shelter. You know, um, when finance thinks of property they think tax shelter, and that's the difference. Mm. You build the you build the building for the tax breaks that come with it. That's what you're building it for. And also for the potential income streams which may come from it, which you can then monetize and send into to kind of special purpose vehicles all around the world. Now, they don't really need office space, and I'll show you why now, why they can have. Now, remember, there's 2.5 trillion under administration, and there's all this kind of empty office spaces. How is that possible? Well, uh, this is five Harbour Master places. You walk out of the rear of the Conley Station, it's just on your left. Um, there's around 728 uh, companies uh, registered in five Harbour Master places. Um, what, this is one of them, Sitara Finance Company Limited. And it's registered here under the Secretary, and the Secretary is Deutsche International Corporate Services. This is, this is one of the services which uh, Deutsche Bank a offshoot of Deutsche Bank, that's what they sell or offer in, in, in Ireland. If you want to set up a company, a register a company for tax purposes in, in Ireland, they'll handle all the paperwork for you. They'll tick all the boxes for you. One of them is to have at least two directors who are resident in Ireland and they'll provide as part of the service. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the persons who, who, who does this um, not to pick on her, she's just working in an office, right? So I, I, I always feel bad kind of highlighting Emer, but I mean, she's just working in an office here, you know what I mean? Like, you know, that's part of our job being like Deutsche. But, but, but Emer McGrath here acts as a director for companies. That's part of her remit for Deutsche International Services. And the companies that she is a, that she is a director for if you go onto the company registration um, office kind of database, 
It's um, what's that one here? Oh, I've I've gone back. There's all of these here. What's the figure you gave earlier? How many did you say? Did you say seven hundred at least. Well, I found seven hundred and uh, and twenty eight, and that's and that's not even really the trying, if you know what I mean. Um, there's at least that number. Uh, but she's she's the rector of all these companies here, and here, and she's here. Meetings all day. So this is like an official scout. Yeah, and here, and then she's a past a director of these ones here, and here, and here, and here, and then we go back to what it's all about. Um, it's about tax avoidance, really. That's what it is. So he set up all these companies. Um, but they're here just to avoid tax. Those who benefit from that system are those who know how to handle tax claims, who know who can, who, who can take your hand and walk you through the labyrinth of Irish tax law. So the ones who can do that, of course, are the accountants and, and the law firms. And they're the ones who do it. They've got local knowledge, and that's what they trade. So if you want to avoid tax, then you talk to us in, in, in Ireland. They make millions from it, absolute millions from it. And they're the ones who, who lobby government about all of this. But that's the indigenous Irish kind of bourgeoisie. It's not directly linked with the bank guarantee itself, but it's, part, it's one part of how this kind of bourgeoisie class, or compador class, as, as, as I call them, how they have operated. Historically, they've been here for fucking generations. Um. This is a uh, five hard master place itself, an indoor shop. I didn't go in myself. Um, this, this one, Daft IE, it's actually up now at the moment. This is the second floor of five hard master place. It's for rent. 728 companies, the second floor is empty. Look at it. I mean, like, doesn't it just scream entrepreneur? Mm. <laughs> you know? Doesn't yeah. it just bleed it from you? Doesn't it just see from its very Where's bones? Where's the whiteboard? This is it, you know, so hopefully he's like standing behind it, you know. I mean, of all the pictures which you have as the first one, it's the, it's the one foot on the cafe in the canteen here. They've got this, you know. 36,000 yearly. Because in Ireland, if you pay rent at this level, it may be tax deductible anyway. So who cares how much you, 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 you know, you're charged. If you're a certain company, if, if you can avail of that, you can write off tax as a, as, you know, rent as a tax write off anyway, so. Beautiful cares. Yeah. Uh, and also, I suppose it's a barrier to entry as well, too, uh, for people well, who are people not like rich me. enough to pay the same. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or, 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 yeah. Or, or people like me yeah. opening up an office in Five Half Massive Place and just having some fun. You know? Yeah. <laughs> um, but that's it. So, yeah. even with the 728 companies at least, uh, Emer, who again, I, I, I don't want to pick on, but I mean, it, 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 it is part of my job, a director of about kind of 200 companies. Perhaps she trod those very carpet tiles. Every one of these companies is put forward as the government as foreign direct investment. Now, again, we'll just like kind of touch on how that works about foreign direct in investment. I don't have the this slide here, but the largest single source of foreign direct investment into Ireland is from where do you think it would? I mean, but from the newspapers, they would lead you to believe that it comes from where? FDI comes from where? From which country? America. Yeah, I mean, this is the narrative, isn't it? It's, it's, it, it's, it's the US. It comes from Bermuda. That's the largest single yeah. um, source of FDI into Ireland. Ireland also is invests, th there's money that's in Ireland that's invested inside of Ireland. The largest single recipient of investment from Ireland, where do you think it is? Yeah. Cayman yeah. Islands. It's Bermuda. <laughs> oh, I picked the wrong place. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it comes in. It's washed of his tax, yeah. Yeah. goes straight back out again. You know, and though and nobody does this for love, this isn't a hobby. If you're washing it, it, that tax, it's all fees, and you're talking millions. Mm. That's the industry. Mm. That's the, the kind of cottage industry in, 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 in Ireland, and it has a grip on on national economic policy. Um, but here we go. As to where this thing about how this has all happened, how can all these trillions flow into Ireland? In what's happening here. Well, this is from the Financial Times. I strongly recommend people reading the Financial Times. Read it for gist. Just start reading it. It's like learning a language where you start reading it and you pick up certain verbs and words, but then suddenly you start getting their language because they, they do have their own 
language uh, per se, but once you get a sense of it, it is incredible. It is incredible how to see how they see the world. Um, it'll take a while, same as learning a, a language, but, but once you see it, you'll always see it. So I was reading, as always, an article here from a journalist, an, an American journalist writing an opinion piece in the Financial Times called, his name is uh, Christopher Caldwell, and he's talking to March about how the, the Dow Jones Industrial Average rallied beyond 14,300 points last week, passing the highs it reached in 2007, just as the world economy was starting to wobble. But he's asking, if stocks and share, you know, if the, if the index is at this really high level, highest level almost ever, where is all the exuberance, where is all the jobs, where is all the activity that should come with you know, people saying, well, all these companies are doing really well. He says that, well, part of the reason why people feel or get less giddy about the Dow than did five years ago is that they've learned a bit about inequality. What looks like a recovery, a rally, or an increase in consumer confidence may just be the effect of elites passing money among themselves. Going back to Ireland again. This image here, I would love to say this was mine, but it's not. This is from a law firm. Mm. Um, and this is, this is from their brochure on, a, on an SPV, on special purpose vehicles, and how to uh, use them in Ireland for investment kind of purposes. Uh, it's from Arthur Cox. This, this is their own image as to what Ireland does. It's incredible. It's like, I always think of that, of the monologue from Bill in Kill Bill, where he says that, Clark Kent is Superman's image of what humanity is, 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 is like. But this is, I think, kind of Arthur Cox's view of, of their view of what Ireland's role is and what Ireland is. <coughs> Assets come in, washed up their tax obligations, and go straight back in. That's Ireland's role in this, in this whole system. Um, so putting it all together. What looks like a recovery, a rally, or an increase in consumer confidence may just be the effect of, of elites passing money um, among themselves. In that world system of elites passing money among themselves, Ireland has carved out a niche role in that. It's not for every kind of tax avoidance, there's only kind of certain aspects of it. Each tax haven has its own niche, its own special powers if you want. It's like the Avengers, you know? <laughs> Each one has its own power. And Ireland has its own special powers. And it's mainly around uh, money market funds and uh, special purpose vehicles. And, uh, and, UK, and UK, it's the, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's an EU investment uh, fund um, uh, architecture. And that's really kind of Ireland's niche in all of this. Um, oh, and, and the big one, of course, is uh, is patents and, 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 and royalties. That's Ireland's really big one. Um, patents and royalties, payments for patents and royalties in Ireland are tax deep, deductible. So if you take Google, Google Ireland is, is a company that's based in, in Dublin. Google Ireland Holdings is an Irish company that holds the patents on, I think it's the Google search engine a, um, algorithm. I think it's on the like, the, the like algorithm, but it, it, it may be on the kind of the dynamics of the search engine itself. Now, both are Irish companies, but under Irish tax law, you are you can be registered as a company in Ireland, but for tax purposes, you're taxed where your management meets, and the management of Google Ireland Holdings meets not in Dublin but in Bermuda. So, so under one arm of the state sees it as an Irish company. Another arm of, of, of the state, for tax purposes, sees it as a Bermuda company. That means that when Google Ireland, when Google Ireland Holdings then charges Google Ireland for using Google search engine for making money, that charge is tax deductible. What that means is that in, two, in 2009, you know, for example, Google booked sales of 5.6 billion in their Irish office. They just put all the sales through the deal at the Irish office. They don't actually happen here. Um, but then it was charged um, for using, for renting the, the algorithm. It was charged by Google Ireland Holdings, I think 5.5 billion, which meant that under Irish tax law, that was tax de deductible from its, from its sales, which meant that Google's 
um, tax obligations now were not 5.6 billion but 100 million. That's kind of what Google does. Google charges itself for using Google and mm. use it as a tax write-off. Mm. And in the media, in the Irish state, it said, oh, we're just, these are loopholes in like, in like US law. The loophole, well, first of all, it's not a loophole because it's the law itself. And loopholes are gaps in the law. This isn't a gap in the law, this is the law itself. Uh, and secondly, it's the Irish state that says where management sits is where you were taxed. That, we wrote that. Connor, is this why the government won't change the natural resources taxation royalty situation? I don't know. Oh. I mean, that's a short answer. No. I, 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 um, so have you any knowledge on that, Rod? Or, um, no, I, 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 I really don't know. Because it doesn't make sense, because it just yeah. seems mad, like from every point of view, from everybody, you know, even from financial people, it just like, doesn't make any sense, the fact that you're not going to judge. Yeah. You know, oil companies, anything, but if this starts to make sense, if, that's, yeah. if that would, you know, first come in, what's the... I really don't know, yeah. and um, and there may be, Aiden, it'll cross over, or there mightn't be. Yeah. The, the short answer is that I haven't really kind of looked well, it into it. could be something similar. This, there must be a payoff to them. There must be a huge financial payoff to them. It could be, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I mean, someone's making money from it, but mm -hmm. um, where this class yeah. tends to make money is in the back room operations. My suspicion yeah, yeah. is that that's where people are getting paid, is handling the, the yeah. paper. But again, I don't know. It may be worth kind of yeah. chasing, you know, um, but the, the answer is that I don't know. But the pharmacemicals, I use it all the time as well. Mm. So I mean, all the all the pharmacemicals will charge them, themselves for the patents yeah. on the, you know, on the drugs. And then that's that's tax write off in, mm. in, in, in Ireland. You know? mm. I was just wondering, is, uh, I mean, the you know, transfer pricing thing that multinationals used to do here, I mean, that's in the same flavour of thing. It's the same flavour, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is another, I mean, this is Ireland's niche, mm, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, the whole point then is that you make the law so complicated that only you have the knowledge to, to bring foreign companies to it. Mm. You make yourself important as a mm. lawyer. That's part of it as mm. well. You have to make yourself in, in, important, mm. you know? Sorry, the kind of frivolous question, but no, no, no. Uh, is the Arthur Cox diagram there? If you imagine that as a kind of a machine or a process, you know, I'm just trying to imagine, you know, what sound does Ireland make when it, you know, when it actually turns those financial, in, you know, assets <laughs> yeah. through the the Mangler to the yeah, investors? Exactly. Does it involve uh, traditional uh, music uh, or something? Uh, I don't know. Of <laughs> yeah. Danny Boyd, say, uh, you know. Yeah. Um, and this is, uh, this is part of the reason why we have these type of, of, of headlines. Exports hit a record high of 182 billion because they've added in financial exports into this figure as well. This isn't just goods, this is services as, as well. Mm. So, so they're adding these exports into the overall figure. So that's why it can look like exports are at the high. I mean, this is higher than anything during the Catatoga years. Mm. Um, but this is the this is what we see. One in five shops and lying empty as retail prices deepen. And the interesting thing here, of course, is that one in five shops empty is, is seen as a as a crisis. One in five office space, or one fifth of office space empty, is saying, "Well, let's build more office space." No one's saying the a solution here is to build more empty shops. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm. But that's the logic that they're trying to sell us because. Mm. They know how to monetize that, uh, those empty offices and send it around the world. That's mm. what they do. Um, but yes, yeah, so this is one of the reasons why the, 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 there's a disconnect. A lot of it is accountancy um, that is being kind of put forward. So we have this kind of disconnect here. I'm surprised about those rates there, like 20% of stores in Cork. I'm starting to wonder if that's the ones that are in a Caledon built that have never been occupied. Like yeah. this. It looks, when you walk around Dublin, it looks like there's far more shops empty than there in Cork. In, in, in Dublin, yeah. Yeah, yeah look, you really see it, you really don't yeah, see yeah. it in Cork. I'm just wondering, but there's these yeah. huge vacant spaces that were built by, mainly by Owen Cullen, basically, yeah. and were never filled because of the crash happened before. It could be, you know, if you build, uh, if you build malls around, yeah. or shopping centres yeah, around yeah, kind of Cork edges, yeah. did it? Oh, yeah. They did, yeah. Maybe, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. guessing yeah. here, but yeah. that might be it then as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, Dublin... Not as many as in Dublin, though. Well, O'Connor Street is, is, 
is incredible. It is incredible. Yeah. yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's like North Main Street. Yeah. yeah. If Where, you're not familiar with Cox. No, no, no. In North Main Street, it's part of the old, it's the old city, essentially. On the north side, it's all yeah, 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 north, yeah, it's actually in Central Island. Uh, oh, right. Yeah, and I don't know. Yeah. It's, uh, it's like uh, Shane McGowan's mouth. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One side of it. Pre-op or post-op? Yeah, which one is uh, it? Pre-op. <laughs> pre-op. Yeah. 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 So there you go. That's actually it was a much shorter talk than usual. You've gotten off lightly. Mm. Um, I, I did much more kind of slides there, mm. but I think like like part of what I'm trying to kind of put forward here is that if we lose sight of the intermediaries in in our society, they're the ones who are saying. Mm. It's the Germans, it's the French, they didn't want to do that. It's not to get Europe off the hook, but what they're doing here needs to be kind of brought into analysis as, as well. There's obviously a European element to all of this, but at the same time, the bank guarantee and all of that, that was a homegrown affair. And the development of that class, mm. that's, that's the central theme of the, of the book itself, because there's a reason why, if we're looking at economic class, why we go to history. Um, Weber did it, Durkheim did it, Marx did it. There's a reason for that, because history gives you that canvas to allow you to observe deep social economic forces in motion. That's why they've gone to his. That's the. That, that's why history brings to the table here. It can. It, it, it can allow us to see them move. It's hard to do over five, ten years, mm. you know, and that's why and that part of, kind of political economy, of course, has been lost over the last kind of 20, 30 years, really. I mean, well, it's more, it's, it's stronger in the, in, 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 in like Europe than here, but here it's not, here it's all who shot Collins, you know, mm. and that's it, you know, who really shot Collins, you know, mm. not, you know, so who really, yeah. really shot Collins, yeah. and so on, so on. So, yeah, this, uh, this, sorry to be hogging the thing, but it just kind of reminds me of a debate I had with a comrade about, you could say the choices available to the, you could say the new Irish bourgeoisie in the 1920s, you know, that, you know, they were right next door to the, you could say the, you could say the, at that stage, either the joint biggest or the biggest capital market or capital yeah. bazaar on the planet, they, they'd been habituated to all kinds of things and they also saw too had a, I suppose a cultural patrimony that uh, you know had yeah. little to do with making or doing things, but actually being process servers, perhaps, and also so to the you know the you know the 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 sort of the 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 clerically inspired inutility of their formation, you know. Yeah, well, I mean, well, I mean, I mean, I mean, I make a. I do think they had certain choices, though, but at the same time, too, their position. Kind of an argument here yeah, to I mean, art doesn't break a bit. It, it, um, really, it, it doesn't break with the UK economy with with partition and, yeah. and, and independence. Yeah, it's still I mean, integrated with it. Yeah. I mean, I was over in the in the Bank of England archives uh, uh, last month, and in the 1940s, they're right the same. But you know, as we know, Ireland's really part of the UK economy. You know, and you know, because I mean, Ireland stays Ireland stays part of the sterling area until 1979. Mm -hmm. So we have we have a, an experience of being part of the currency union um, we have a, a 50 60 year experience of being a nominally in, in, mm. independent country but yet still being part of a, of a currency union and having no control over the policies of that central bank so we so we do have a history of that here you know um, but yeah I mean there was an intermediate like it, it there's a running kind of a business kind of trend uh, to this class in Ireland is that they positioned themselves as intermediaries in between foreign capital and the resources of the of the Irish state. Um, in the past, they would have been kind of physical resources. In some cases, they still are. But the one that's really traded now is the ability of a nation state to set its own tax laws oh, and have yeah. those tax laws then recognised internationally. Mm. There's only 204 yeah. uh, sovereign states on, on the planet. If if sovereign states were tigers, they'd be an endangered species. And, 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 and companies like Apple and Google have access to the law-making facilities of one of those nation states. If you can get them access, then that will make you and your kid very, very rich. And everyone else then, then pays for it. Can, so I, it's play, never, uh, yeah, yeah. can I play devil's advocate? Of course, yeah, yeah. Um, so 
you know that you said like 5.6 billion minus 5.5 billion yeah. equals 100 million but yeah. is that 100 million that we wouldn't ever see if google wasn't here though well we don't get to see that because what google because they, no that no no that was their that was their tax that was the taxable income that wasn't what they paid in in in, in tax well whatever it, it was 16 million in the in the end yeah so even but it, but well not really because i mean what are the costs of of, of maintaining <coughs> this nation state as a nation state mm -hmm. i mean what's the cost of raising and, and so who, and, who and, ultimately and education? who ultimately benefits then uh, from well, uh, the like where does you know the money goes to you you say the bourgeoisie which is a deliciously marxist term yeah which seems i think kind of out of date now but uh would you, so, would, but they is it that. to the is it to the um <coughs> is it to the shareholders in google say or is it to um is it to like where does where does that money go ultimately which money well the well you the money that isn't say paid into Process. Well, I mean, I, um, a lot of it is being offshore because they they can't send it back into the states because if you do, it will be taxed mm -hmm. back in the states. So a lot of it is, is being kind of offshore. So what Google does, mm -hmm. same as Apple, is that they take out loans in the US to, mm -hmm. to make the dividends and then pay off those loans from the money that is offshore, in you know, internationally. You know, well, but the losers are are us because if you're talking about, I mean, like how much is it is a passport? Two hundred and something, isn't it? A passport. A passport costs fifty-five point five billion a year to maintain. <laughs> That's what it costs. Because if you don't have a nation state, you don't have a passport. Mm -hmm. It's not hundred euros. It's not eighty euros. It's fifty-five, sixty-six billion a year, and that's current expenditure. There's another eight billion then for capital expenditure. So if you want to maintain a nation state, you've got to work out a way of maintaining it. And one of the ways that is to cut taxation. Mm -hmm. I mean, that would seem to me to be a kind of brainer. So why is it then that recently there was like something in the paper, um, a friend of mine was saying to me that Ireland is apparently, apparently the sixth um, best place in the world for like cost of living or something like this or yeah who's that boy i mean mm -hmm. like what's the sources for it it's it's, uh, it's from a newspaper i mean mm. it just seems to me that um like as i say as devil's advocate right yeah no it just problem. seems yeah, that um yeah. even the devil needs an advocate yeah it seems that like to analyze this stuff you know kind of you're only showing like just what's happening in Ireland. You're not showing where, say, the money eventually or where it eventually ends up. Or so the title of the book is tracing the decisions that shaped the Irish economy. I would have thought that the title would kind of give away why I was talking about Ireland in the in the mm -hmm. talk. But I mean, that was just me, though, you know. But well, if I come in there, so you were saying there about um, mm -hmm. you, you said that we lose out from the, for example, Irish corporate. You're talking regime, about over right? over ten, fifteen. In 20 years you were losing out of course you were. yeah but in the case of corporation tax the fact that we're getting a small bit of money from lots of companies right mm -hmm. is actually depriving other countries tax take in other words we're is that not the case that like you know if if, if for example all countries had a, a reasonable corporate tax regime yeah. then they might be able to fund your public services a bit better but well, like, i mean even even in terms of the corporation tax because a corporation tax since 2003 is a flat rate all across the, the country. I mean, up to 2003, does anyone know uh, what the corporation tax rate was for indigenous Irish companies? Something about 25 percent or 28 percent. It was. It was. It was 24 percent, and then it drops down to 12 and a half. Yeah. Normally. The median um, tax rate for companies in Ireland is zero. Corporation tax rate is zero. Because 66 percent of all companies in Ireland pay zero corporation. Um, in, because it's not just about, it's not one rate for foreign companies and then one rate for Irish companies. So in 2003, Ireland had to get rid of its special status for IFC type companies. So instead of raising it up to the rate that was across the, the country, those companies got a 66% uh, tax cut overnight. 
Secondly, people set themselves up as corporations. So you have professionals who get paid as, as, as companies and then claim the corporation tax rate. So you have like Manny Finucane, who would be one. Um, who's the one after like prime time again? Miriam O'Callaghan? Uh, Miriam O'Callaghan, yeah, whose who's, who's company's called Baby Blue. <laughs> <laughs> um, Tuberty. And Tuberty has one as well. Yeah. And they're just examples. So, yeah, yeah, Pat as well. And then you get into the Jim Power. You know, he was a, you know, you know, he's an economist, and I'm talking about. That's what he's talking about these And he needs them to kind of, you know, he'll come on and talk about, you know, Ireland's kind of local, local corporation tax rate. He set up as a company and has a vested interest in this. Mm -hmm. So even having a debate about what tax should be in this country, it's very hard to really get a, a get into that kind of a debate because it's always put forward as corporation tax means debt. Yeah. And I go, no, 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 no. Yeah. It, it means the law firms who run the sale model. Yeah, if they're yeah. set up as like companies as well. So we're losing now in, in terms of that kind of tax take as well. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I, I mean, other from the figures. You know? So I mean, it, it's, it's more than just Google. It's mm -hmm. more than just than what's going on there. I mean, even in terms of, of, like, of like foreign companies in Ireland, there's around 98,000 people working for foreign companies in Ireland. At the moment, there's 2.2 million in the in the workforce. There's 1.89 million who are working at the moment. So to make the argument, as the newspapers do, that Google, and Dell, these are the ones who are keeping the Irish economy afloat. And they're the ones where growth is coming. To make that argument means then saying that of the 1.89 million who are there, you know, there's around what 1.8 million are doing nothing. You know what I mean? You know, that, 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 that has to be neutral in order for this to be such a huge kind of benefit. That just simply doesn't make sense. What actually keeps this country going is the, is the, is the 1.82 million, 8.4 million who are, who are paying tax all the time. It's, we subsidise those 98,000 jobs. And, and the reason why we subsidise those 98,000 jobs is not for the jobs themselves, but for all of the tax work and all, all, all the paperwork that comes with it. That's the cottage industry that's kind of built around it. And that benefits, yeah, that does benefit parts of the, of the country. It benefits parts of, of, of Dublin, it benefits parts of Cork, parts of Galway, parts of Kilkenny. There's a Phoenician like Kilkenny, but that's really it. So in, in, in terms of actually having a national tax policy and a national economic policy, it's very difficult when it's all focused on one regional kind of policy. It doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't make sense. Maybe it makes sense to, to, to other people. To have a national economic policy run as a regional economic policy, but it doesn't make sense to me. Well, I suppose it's a bit like the, you know, the, the national newspapers, you know, up to a few years ago, you know, giving ridiculous amounts of coverage to the Leinster Senior Schools Rugby Cup. It's, it's, a, you know, to a degree, it's a class thing in that, you know, the employment policy of the Irish state is to make sure that people from good backgrounds have jobs to go to and yeah. good ones, nice, nice intellectually challenging, process-serving jobs. Yeah. <laughs> So what would your um, solution to the kind of the, um, the tax system be then? Well, I mean, it, it, it would mean kind of, you know, um, it really kind of looking at the, at the kind of tax system in, 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 in Ireland. It would mean kind of looking at wealth in Ireland and actually kind of measuring wealth uh, for a start. There's no measurement of wealth in, in, in Ireland. It hasn't been one since 1981. Wealth is not measured in this country. We measure income. But the richer that you get, the less your income comes from your wage. Mm -hmm. So Ireland doesn't measure wealth. So, I mean, part of that then will be part of it. We do know that's around 60 billion in Irish source assets in the IFSC. And we don't know actually what they are. So in terms of like of, of the capital gains tax, that the moment runs at around half a billion. That's, that's, kind of, that's kind of coming in. That's less than... That's about kind of, that's about, that's about kind of one one point five percent of the total tax take. I personally would put more emphasis on taxing wealth than taxing income. That would be my thing to actually force that money into the circulation. And those money flows, though, that you were kind of pointing out. Oh, sure. I just kill them. They are just bloodsuckers. You yeah. Know? And that's and, and that's just not in terms of of our end as well. I mean, this is a debate that even kind of Europe has to have. That you know, I mean, capital. Controls have to kind of talk about all over again, you mm -hmm. know, because I mean having money kind of sloshing around mm -hmm. is highly destructive. Mm -hmm. George Soros has a 
has a really good analogy about this. He, uh, he compares all this flows, mm -hmm. he compares them to um, an oil tanker. And he says that in a oil tankers, there are compartments every so often mm -hmm. to stop all the oil sloshing around because if it does, it's a kind of stable. So, I mean, George Soros, I don't know whether he's a Marxist or it's taking the bourgeoisie. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, but, you know, maybe he would. I, I do know that for a class analysis, you will get that from the Financial Times, mm -hmm. that they would talk about uh, inflation as an arena of class struggle. Mm -hmm. So, so I, find it, I find it interesting how in their newspapers, they will talk about class. And they talk about e economic class and say, yes, mm -hmm. of course it is, it, 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 it is economic class. And they talk about how, in the last 30 years, um, a assault uh, on, on inflation has been at the cost of labour share of overall GDP. That's been the, the kind of cost of it. I, I mean, all from historical you know, um, analysis, that when you have such in, uh, imbalances, that leads to s systemic instability. And that's what you know we're kind of seeing now as well. So tax actually even serves a leveling kind of function in, in, in terms of an overall economic kind of strategy. But that's not how it's seen now because it's seen as just me and, and the individual. So I mean, all these arguments have to be kind of taken on board, I think. You know, but sorry, did I say something there? Well, um, one of the main things now in the news is also that uh, Ireland apparently is ending the crisis circle. What's your what's your comment on that? Absolute nonsense. Could you elaborate? A bit. Well, I mean, I mean, uh, if you're if you're talking about what, I mean, if you're talking about they say it's the last, job. Uh, well, they just said it's the last uh, uh, deposit from the ECB. Yeah. A few billions, and that's it. Then, they, then now they Europe needs the EU and eurozone needs a success story for austerity, and Ireland is its best bit, and they're just they've been cooking the books big, uh, big time to try and kind of make that out. I mean, I don't have the breakdown of the uh, of the figures now, but there's a group in Austria called Attack Attack Austria. Mm -hmm. He was in touch with, and they've been doing a breakdown of the of the payments which Ireland has been making, and they're saying these don't make any sense. Mm -hmm. to us. So Ireland's paying not just the Troika back, but the pain, you know, but its payments coming from Denmark, from the UK, and then from the Troika as well. And it's not. This is all. This doesn't make any sense, and for me, I said, well, that's, that reads to me like they're just like picking the clubs. Europe needs to have something in Europe that says austerity works, because it, it's getting it from all sides. I see. You know? So I think that's what's going on here. I mean, even in terms of the last kind of job figures which came out, where you said that they're making, what, 3,000 jobs? 13,000. 13,000 jobs a week or a day, was it? 56,000 <laughs> in the last year. <laughs> yeah. And 14,000. 14,000 on, and they were like, job seeker and 56,000 overall in the last yeah. year. 56,000 and, and I think 40% of those jobs came from, from one sector. Did you hear what's... Tourism and agriculture. That was a large one as well. That was the, I think that was the second or the third largest one. But the largest one was, was agriculture. And... Did you say? I said tourism and agriculture. I'm oh, sorry, <laughs> oh my god, all I heard was it, was it was tourism. So right and right, yeah, absolutely. But in the quarterly household survey, that's a random sample survey of, of, of 54,000 households, in the small print of that report, they says, very careful with these figures. These figures for I, I, I don't know, agriculture don't make any sense to us, so treat them with great caution. Of course, that's not how it was spun in the in the newspapers. It's like mm -hmm. you know, you know, we're making all these jobs, but, you know. So I mean, there's stuff kind of going on even mm -hmm. even there. They go. I mean, what? How many people are unemployed in, in this country? And I think the jobs bridge is is considered to be oh, yeah. actual jobs, yeah. whereas actually <laughs> there's, there's, there's still you're still getting a social yeah. welfare payment plus Slavery, an extra I mean, yeah. Yeah. fifty. Yeah. Um, yeah. 50 euro, you know, but so, you have, yeah. but they, I think they are counted in the, the new yeah. jobs figures. Yeah. yeah, and in the in the live register, they'll say... Yeah, that they're it, gone. It, it, the live register is not a, a measure of unemployment. What, what measures unemployment in Ireland, this is a random sample survey, which they, of like 54,000 households, and then they extrapolate how many people are, are, are working, are not working, from that random sample survey, Instead of from the actual live register that is of people who are actually going to sign on mm -hmm. and, and gives if they're working part time or, or, or not. 
So. Sorry, we really technical question actually on the part of the National Household Survey is when you say that it's actually it's a random thing, is that the, the, there's no actual structure to the sampling? Um, they give there's a very handy video on their on the website. Right. You go into how it's done. done. Right. Now, now, now listen, I mean, it works in its own kind of parameters. They're not yeah. the ones making claims. It's not the CSO who are making the claims on it. Yeah, the I claims on that, it. Yeah. Like I mean, like it's still useful. Yeah. But it's a it's a rule of thumb, if you know what I mean. Yeah. It's a handy one, and it's about trends mm. more than just the actual figures themselves. Mm. It only makes sense over, you know. 14, 15 months because even if it's biased, the bias is consistent. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's where you get into seeing well, maybe this can tell us something. So the bias wouldn't, isn't that much of a problem if you know, as long as the bias is consistent all the way through, mm -hmm. you can still draw something out from it. That's not how, how it's been stuck, you know, how it's been spun. So, I mean, in terms of, 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 of Ireland itself, in terms of, of where kind of job should be, in, in, in terms of even this kind of a discontent crisis, any kind of investment, instead of like two billion into into building office blocks, if you really wanted to kind of maintain the Irish economy in the short uh, to to medium term, in a crisis there should be in investment in as much of the non-export side of the economy that is possible. And non-export isn't just goods; it's also services, and that means education and 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 health and like infrastructure. So, I mean, these are strategies that could be in, implied, but the bulwark there is that, in terms of education and health, these are the two areas that finance wants to privatise more and more. The last thing that they want is more kind of money pulling back their uh, private in, investment seeking kind of strategies. I mean, if, if you have a, you know, a Minister for Health who is so stupid, he actually loses money on his own, in, you know, um, care. Um, it's, 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 a, it's, an, it's an old folks care mm -hmm. centre and he still loses money on it even though he gets to, to write the like, yeah. laws but you have a, a health minister who has his, his, his investment strategies tied up in private care assistance you know so I mean, even in terms of a, of a strategy in, even in terms of you know how do you deal with the crisis has been kind of skewed as well another point then as well of course is that when um, when there was talk of expanding the non-export services a bit based part of, of your economy um, a, a, as a way of like trying to, to kind of compensate for the crisis a line that's put forward is that if you do that it would be inflationary you know so then it gets back into well maybe we need some in inflation it goes back into our tension that is in, in inflation it's not right or wrong there's a tension in capitalism in, in inflation. It's a, it is a, it's a, it, it's a clash of of, 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 of different class interests. Yes. Yes. It's not that one is right and one is wrong. These are there, and these need yeah. to be mediated. Yeah. And what's happened in the last kind of 30, 40 years is that one side has been setting on the agenda, and it's been highly unbalanced. I mean, that's part of the of the post World War social and democratic uh, compromise was that kind of way of kind of having a compromise with capital and, and labor. And that's broken down. Then one side has more or less kind of set the agenda. It's been highly unstable. So I mean these things have been brought back under the table. But if you talk about raising inflation in, in, in Ireland, you know, it's 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 tinfoil hat stuff, you know. Um, even though Paul Krugman and uh, Ed Sulch and the, even the Financial Times calls for it, it makes a difference, you know. Because how finance makes money depends on low inflation. You know, that's another clash there as well. So I mean all these all these kind of balls in the air. I think these are worth kind of being in mind, uh, you know, you know, but keeping in mind in any kind of conversation around uh, the economy. But I think that these are points that are probably worth kind of teasing out more, you know. And you know that financial tax that Germany seems to be in favour of yeah. pushing through, but um, Britain seems to continually um, be opposed to because yeah, they it's the financial transactions tax. Yeah, it's a big thing for attack as well. It's a big kind of push for this as well. Um, why? I mean, is it because Germany doesn't rely so much on the financial services that they see this as a a beneficial thing? It's a bit. It's a bit of a, a no. It's a. It's a. It's. 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 Yeah. That's. That's more or less part of it. Is that Germany still makes things. 
So that kind of intra class kind of conflict with with kind of with, with industry and, and finance. I mean this isn't an inter class conflict, this is in capitalism itself. That that it, it, the capitalist kind of producers and capitalist kind of financiers fight over inflation itself. It's not just workers and 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 the capitalists. So in in Europe as well in Britain, fi, uh, 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 industry was hollowed out. What argument is, and I would agree with it to kind of break the kind of trade union movement. Uh, they offshored their industry to break the trade union movement in the in the 1980s. Germany didn't quite do that. So there are still those tensions there, and you had even uh, German car makers there recently saying we wouldn't mind a weak euro because it would make our exports mm. a lot a, a mm. lot better. But finance likes a good strong currency because it, that's what it trades. It. You know, so th these you are the tensions, and these need, and these need to be kind of mediated. So that may be kind of part of it. I am hearing though that uh, the lobbyists in, in in Brussels have had their have have gotten their hands on the financial on the financial transactions tax and they've more or less you know, emasculated it with like so much that how much in, in you know how much point you would have now is probably under is, is probably a, a kind of big point. But that is but that is part of it. That Germany still has that kind of tension. Though, though having said that, Germany's uh, its its industry is more kind of high tech and high tech needs finance. So there is more of a of a of a confluence with with high tech and 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 finance than it would be with kind of heavy industry. High, high tech needs the venture capitalists, it, it needs that finance, it needs all, all, all the kind of turnover. So there's more of a marrying at that end of it than there would be in in, 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 in the other parts of it. But the tension is still there. And I think we are seeing them parts of it. Also, there's probably a a a, a higher capitalized a population on these issues in Germany than it will be here. I mean, why anyone in Ireland would fight for low cooperation tax when it's their children who have to, to emigrate as a as a consequence of it just baffles me. You know. But that's what happens, you know. You know what I mean? So I mean like there are issues there like played out. Um would you know if Ireland is uh, currently part of the uh, European stability mechanism? Yes, um, yes it is. And, 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 and Ireland so has to pay for it, and, and so is Portugal. So how. Oh, no, actually, no, we're not. Because of the, of the bailout, we were actually taken out of it then. I see, no. Okay. But we had to be paid into it. So I think after December, we're probably going back into it again. Well, after oh. the like, like 15th. I don't know, though. I mean, I, I, I can't kind of, kind of check that. I kind of look at yeah. I, I was kind of looking at it, and it appears to be like a, sup, a form of super state that actually devours states that make the mistake to sign to be part of this stability mechanism plan because they effectively they take the full possession of all the. Oh, sorry. Oh, that meant, yeah. I mean, Ireland is a member of that. I mean, Ireland passed a, the mecha, yeah. a, 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 a constitution it, for it. You know, it 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 it, it changed. It's it, it's it's it, it's a constitution. Oh, is that the last it. referendum? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or that taking the, that from that the that was your state which yeah. is insane. Saying that we're going to keep kind of budgets at three percent and zero point one percent. This is madness. Mm. Absolute madness. Can I ask a question? This is in relation to Ireland now, but it's in relation to the the EU US trade agreement that's being worked on at the moment. I, I've been reading up a little bit about this thing about investor protection. Uh, I just had, can, just, can you tell me a bit about it? As far as I, I know, it. again, yeah. I'm playing the catch up here as well. Yeah. But as far as I know, it's offshore uh, courts. Yeah. Mm. It's courts that have the, the full power of courts, but they're not based within any kind of nation state. It's extra, you know, mm. it's extra kind of nation state kind of jurisdiction. And, and they can, and, and they can the override. Class. They can override EU and and US um, like law. You know, mm. I mean the. Extreme example that was put forward was if a country in in the EU bans a genetically a modified food, um, they could be sued for loss of earnings by the company that mm. has those those kind of products, mm. and they could probably win in this in this in this. They probably wouldn't even have to prove that they had any intention to enter that market in the first place. Yeah, so like you know, but yeah. I mean, but that's I mean that's the more kind of 
extreme of it, but it is it is quite worrying. I mean, yeah. George and Marable in the in the Guardian has been writing an awful lot about it. And, you know, I I'm playing kind of catch up. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't really have my ball on it. But that part, as far as I know, is what it is. It, like like that like, the, the, like these would be courts that would be able to override yeah. anything that would have even this sniff of a democratic officer. My other question, your pink stuff was in the wake of all the you know, scandals about Apple's, you know, Apple's corporate tax policies and all these co companies avoiding stuff with their, uh, whatever, their ways of doing things. Um, there's, Europe is kind of, ax is being seen now to, to do stuff and promoting, uh, putting forward all sorts of proposals on reforming the system, blah, blah, blah. And Ireland, our, their Irish government seems to be positioning itself as like spearheading this reform agenda of responsible capitalism, uh, you know, and, uh, I mean, I presume, I haven't actually looked into it at all, but I presume that there's nothing that would actually materially affect Ireland's no. niche in the market as such. Or is there actually anything going to come out of it? Do, 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 do you know what I mean? Do, well, I mean, if, if, if you take in the last budget, in the one there uh, in November, no, in, in October, um, that Noonan uh, made a big point of uh, saying that they were going to close the, the Apple uh, loopholes. Mm -hmm. And this is picked up in, 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 in the newspapers as closing the Apple loopholes. But the Apple a loophole they, they were closing, it, it was the one that, uh, that fell on the three Apple subsidiaries that registered in Cork, in the, in the, you know, in the estate in, in Cork, as companies in Ireland, but not registered anywhere on the planet for tax purposes. And this came up in the, in the Senate hearings. Uh, in in May, um, and uh, John McCain and uh, um, and the guy whose name I can't think of now, they brought this up and said, "Are you telling us that for tax purposes you don't exist anywhere on the planet?" He goes, "Well, yeah." <laughs> and uh, and then Ireland said, and they said in the hearings that they'd worked out this special agreement with Ireland. It was all okay. And then Ireland says, "Oh, we'd never heard of this." And no, 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 isn't that at all? And there's nothing wrong going on here. And then they go and change the law anyway. So it seems that and what they changed it to was that those three companies have to nominate somewhere on the planet where their the management meets for tax purposes. So they'll Antarctica? Pick where, they'll pick where they'll, they'll pick where made it. You know I mean? yeah. So, but then Newland made a huge thing about this, and then the, the Irish Independent did as well, about oh, Ireland is getting tough on, 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 on Apple and, and the tax avoidance. It was just that one part of it. Yeah. That was it. It was nothing else. I mean, Apple invented the a double Irish back in 1980. Apple has been innovating in the tax purposes in, in Ireland since 1981, you know? Mm -hmm. And everyone else has been following Apple's kind of lead on this. Well, they are an innovative company. They are innovative, that is true. They yeah. are indeed, you know. And I suppose as semiconductors go, I suppose uh, the yeah, Irish yeah. tax authorities must be among the dopiest <laughs> semiconductors yeah. going. And you apply around... You apply in, in, in Cork, it's around 2,700 people, but you also say 4,000. Right. Really? Because the company implies, that branch of it implies 4,000 people, but they're not all in Ireland. How many of them are in Bermuda? I don't know. You know, if, even in Dublin, uh, like um, part of the of the of the law is that you have to have um, employees in in Dublin in order to register as a as a company. Someone actually here, and um, tax advi tax advisors have been telling companies that um, that. The Department of Finance will accept as employees in, in Ireland. If you fly in for a meeting and have a board meeting in, in Dublin, <coughs> then your employers, you are employed at, at some point in the year in, in, in Ireland and they fly back out again. So, I mean, even in terms of the jobs that are here, it's hard to know actually what's going on, you know. Mm. Mm. In, in terms of the crisis or the ongoing crisis, um, do you see any chance of like fiscal transfers happening in the future? You mean at a at a European level? Yeah, like um, like if we were to stay in the euro zone and and all that, and um, like do you think that they will set up some kind of way of? Let's see. I think I think that was the game plan from the start. Any was that any time they put 
a kind of a federal or united a Europe plan to the people of Europe, a real like one Europe plan. It was it was voted down. And I think what's been put forward is if you build the architecture of the currency, then we'll have to put in all these supports to keep that currency going. And I think that's what's kind of going on now. So the fiscal kind of supports, I don't know about that because I mean that is very contentious. Even in terms, I mean, that's a real election policy in in Germany, for example, um, about how we how we can't have this. Even in terms of the of the um, of the of the of, of the kind of legislation that that's been put in place now for the next round of bank bailouts that are going to happen and they're putting in a, a new legislation. Instead of that being absorbed by the ECB, which is what a lender of, of last resort should do, it's going to be channeled through the nation states have to take out loans and then pass them on to the banks in their areas. And then that's then channeled through then as well. So it still goes through to the taxpayer itself. So whatever's being put forward, time and time again, it, it, like what I see is the interest of finance being covered at the expense of the rest of the, of the, of the population. So like even if banks fail in the future, anywhere in, in, in Europe, it's up to the branch of the ECB, the central bank of that country, uh, to kind of sort it out. And how it sorts it out is by the government buys like credit to then bail out those companies or not those uh, those kind of private banks so that it goes onto the books of the nation state itself. Okay. So I mean how far they'll get with actual fiscal uh, transfer, I mean like it is a huge topic uh, in Germany saying uh, you know having our taxpayers money being transferred to to Greece or to Portugal. But isn't it preferable if isn't it preferable though then to the breakup of the monetary union, though, because well, the it's an internal tensions eventually lead to. Well, I mean, at, at the moment there are twenty-seven countries in the EU. There are, and there are ten, and there are ten currencies. Twenty-eight, also. Oh, oh, twenty-eight. Sorry, and there are, and there are ten currencies. So it's hard to know whether a failed currency that has been in crisis now for half of its of its lifetime. <laughs> Um, it's only been for about 10 years now, and it's been in crisis for, well, no, sorry, since 1999, so let's be a bit fair on them. That was a digital one. Well, there's the, so, um, so 14 years. The... Oh, the snake, yeah, No, yeah. no, the, the, um... Yeah, who? No? Well, the yeah, EORM beforehand, or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the, yeah, it's the yeah. Like that. But no, as yeah. an actual kind of, the actual... <coughs> one Unit of account, yeah. In one kind of, uh, one actual kind of currency. It's been, yeah. not 99, and then, like, hard, hard currency since... Like, since like 2002, by yeah. 2007 it's starting to hit lots. So I mean, they need to look at the architecture of the of the currency itself. It is it is highly dysfunctional. It's a it's a neoliberal currency for a start. It's actually hot wired into the mechanisms of the ECB itself. You know, I mean, it, like the the conceptual frameworks which route themselves to the ECB. It's a neoliberal ideology. Mm -hmm. It's a terrible one for a central bank. You know, it's madness. So I mean, the problems probably aren't. You know what I mean? Like, if you if you want to really get at the heart of, of the problems in the ECB, there are certain things which could be done. One is that the ECB should be allowed to buy a government debt from primary bond traders instead of on the secondary market. I mean, this is like ba basic central bank stuff. It's against EU law for the ECB to sell debt or credit directly and more or less to the nation states. It has to go to the different private markets. This is insane, absolutely insane. The ECB sells credit at wholesale rates to private banks, who then sell it on at market rates to the nation states, who underpin the ECB in the in the first place. This is a con. It's an absolute scam. You know, I mean, like, I mean, like this is this really is mad. You know, so I mean, if you want to reform the ECB, I'd start there. You know, absolutely, beef up the development bank, beef it up, start having that for infrastructure investment. That would go against the whole ideology of of privatized public services. You know, you know what I mean. So I mean, like, it's not that they can't sell credit. It's that if they start giving 
a credit injection to the state apparatus for, 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 for fucking public services that may then delay their strategies for privatizing these these whole fields of 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 human activity. You know what I mean? So I mean, these are some of the, the like I I see these as, as 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 huge problems. You know, having done fiscal transfers won't get over that hump. If you know what I mean, you know, as important as they are. If you know what I mean, to like I mean like to having any kind of any kind of um, operating kind of central bank. Wouldn't fiscal transfers though entail a sort of direct? Um, if you, you mean know, kind like of, an, well, um, if, if you mean kind of um, excess kind of um, excess tax in in some countries being uh, transferred to parts of the of the EU, yeah, that's exactly that's, what I mean. Yeah, you know, that's in kind of deficit. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, it would you know involve that, you know, yeah. This kind of bit late, though. Yeah. yeah. Question about, I suppose, uh, you could say, you know, I'm, I'm more yeah, like right, right. Let other people speak. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And also, maybe we should be put some kind of closure time on this. Cause yeah. Just yeah. To, to be fair, I'm Connor because he's been standing yeah, yeah, yeah. a long time. It's getting. Oh, what time is it? I'm just saying stop now and just you saying that some kind of agreement to when we're going to. Five minutes. Hey, what time is it? It's quarter past. Quarter past now. Yeah. Twenty past. Before being honest. We'll just take questions from people who haven't spoken, or people who haven't spoken really. Um, well, can I grab? Yeah, of course, yeah, yeah, absolutely. What I want to say is the wrong kind of fiscal transfer going yeah. on here. I cannot see the A friend of me in the Netherlands does a lot with, uh, with the groups in Germany, and I was talking about uh, the European Central Bank. And he went to Germany last weekend because the European oh, Central Bank oh, 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 opens oh, a new. Um, office next autumn, and there are days of action being planned around this new opening. So that might be something to keep in mind. The dates not yet fixed, but there are preparations going. On. And I'm probably going there. So if anybody else wants to go. It's the 22nd to the 25th of May. It's at that time. It's the opening of the new ECB offices. Yeah, the, that's the that's the only one they do. Yeah, where they try to shut yeah. down yeah. the ECB for a day, but in the end of next year, in autumn, the new, there will be the huge celebrations of the opening of the new building. Ah, and okay. And they're planning with even something bigger. They, do, they have like huge plans of trying to prevent the opening of the new building. Is this Frankfurt or? Frankfurt, yeah. yeah. But there's a maze. 15 euros. <laughs> <laughs> That's all they have. 